hey, before I get started today, and as a lot of you know, we're starting a new uh, study um, that's going to be on joy for the last several months. We've been talking about different challenges, went through Jesus, Friend of Sinners, and some of the different things from Catalyst, and just talking about the process and going through the process and not, as God's leading us and guiding us to be more mature and to have a stronger foundation in Him. And uh, we go through some challenges. Sometimes we put ourselves in those challenges. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. Sometimes He puts us in those challenges. Sometimes other people, but their free will does it. But as we're talking about processes, it seems that it's brought up a lot of conversations, as it does, uh, not just myself and people throughout the week, but also in small groups and home groups and as you guys just as friends getting together, just that sometimes it can be challenging talking about that process. So it seemed to me just it's about time to talk about some joy. Everybody good with that? Yeah. And just yeah. joy in that process and how the enemy tries to take that from us and, and how God takes and uh, gives us conscious choice decisions on how we can protect that because it is, a, quite frankly, a conscious choice. So we'll talk about that a little bit. First, uh, before we dig in too much, I want to let you guys know in that process, I keep bringing up these uh, examples of people that keep messing it up over and over again. Uh, but since we're here, I'm not going to talk about it. This is Josh and Amy. Actually, I don't know what you guys say. Sorry. Uh, I have talked about you guys a couple of times, but good ways. Good ways. <laughs> but uh, Josh and Amy, if you guys uh, have not been around, they, they were with the church from pretty much the beginning and just moved down to Columbus a year and a half ago, so I'm thrilled to death that they're, well, that one of them's visiting today, so it's nice to have them. So anyway, so everybody say hi to them, give them hugs, and they give money for out for free. So anyways, with that, just wanted to honor them because they've been a big part of this church and the leadership of this church and the ups and the downs and the struggles, they've been through it all with us. So I just want to honor them. So talking about joy. Ah, one warning, I'm not talking about happiness. When we're talking about joy, we're not talking about happiness. Happiness is an emotional response. It's something that comes. It's something that goes. Circumstances have a lot of control over it. But what we're going to talk about today is joy. You're talking about that very foundation that we can stand on Christ and know things and hold on to things during the tough times. Joy is what gets us through to get back to happiness when the world is trying to take it away or our own decisions are trying to take it away. Joy is going to be a conscious choice decision we're going to talk about. And to dig into this today, because really we're going to spend most of our time in Philippians like it says here on the screen. But today, instead of going there, we're going to start out with a story probably that a lot of you guys have gone through. I'm going to pretend like none of you have gone through it. We're going to start from the same foundation. But we're going to be looking at the story of Job today. So if you want to get your Bibles out, pens, papers, iPads, iPhones, uh, whatever you want to be using, you uh, version, whatever you want to use to study, we're going to go to Job. And if you don't know where it's at, it's not one that's you know, quite quick to your fingers. Feel free to use your index. If you see one that says Job, go there because your head's just mis mispronouncing it. It is Job. And we're going to look at the story of a guy that went from the height of heights down to pretty much Hades in his life. And then God rebuilt him and how he handled it, how the people in his life handled it. And through it, what I want to focus on today is we just kind of lay out the foundation and the introduction today is the four things that the enemy tries to use against the children of God to take and take the joy of God away from us. And then we're just going to hit on them. We're going to identify the four things or the four conscious choices we can make to protect that as we take and seek the, the joy of the Lord. And then the next few weeks, we want to dig into each one of those more in depth. Sound good? So we're going to go pretty deep into this stuff. You guys didn't say anything. Sound good? Yeah. <sighs> okay. It's going to be a rough, rough day. I told you I have friends here. They're watching me. Come on now. You guys got to get in on this. Job chapter 1, verse 1. And we are going to cover, if you notice this, we're going to cover the entire book today. So we've got 42 chapters. So get comfy. You think I'm kidding? I'm covering the whole thing. But it'll be about the same amount of time. But looking at the life of Job, we're going to, again, find these different factors. So I just want to dig into it and see what jumps out as we go. So starting out in verse 1. The table will go with me. There we go. Verse 1, it says, In the land of Uz, Oz, however you want to pronounce it, there lived a man whose name was Job. The man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Okay, so this guy is very prominent, and he's very righteous. This, this guy's like, I don't know who you want to compare it to, the Bill Gates as far as riches. I mean, that, that animals, family, that's how they, they measured worth and wealth at that time. This guy had it all going his way. It says that his sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and that they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking perhaps 
one of my children has sinned, and curse God in their hearts. This was Job's regular co custom. First thing I wanted to spell, and this is kind of a side item, when you're going through a tough time, it's real easy to think, okay, what did I do that made God so mad that he did this to me? That, that, that's a kind of a common thought sometimes. I, I know we ran into, uh, this, this week, Brenda and I were talking a little bit. Brenda works with hospice, if you don't mind me talking about you, Brenda, uh, just to give you guys a week off. But she works with hospice. I work in the nursing homes, as you know, doing Bible studies. And we bumped into each other in the parking lot. And we're kind of talking about some of our friends. Some of our friends we know uh, mutually, some we don't. And we both were sharing stories of caring about people who felt like they were being beaten up because they had done something wrong, or like just seemed like demons were just attacking them and whatnot. And, and, and going through that challenge, but yet they had dementia, so you kind of get a little bit of road with them, and then the conversation would repeat. Uh, a friend of mine, like, she was talking this week about how her husband passed away five, six years ago. And she said, you know, I don't know what I did that made God take him from me. I was like, well, you didn't, sweetie. You know, that, that, that's not necessarily how God works. And we'd work through that, and then about two minutes later, it would repeat, do you know my husband's passed away? And it's hard when you're talking to someone with dementia. But the thing is, is a lot of times for us who don't have that struggle, at least not yet in our lives, we continue to do it by choice. We continue to assign it to somehow we did something wrong, God's mad. Now, let me say this. You might be in a tough situation because you did something stupid. That's very possible. I've been there, and you're dealing with the ripple effects of it. And so as we're going through this, choose to come back to God. Choose to submit that back to him. Choose to go through those ripple effects with him walking beside you, helping you every step of the way. Or again, it could be somebody else has done something that you need to maybe give some forgiveness and some boundaries into place so that you can be on the path to God and following God righteously. But it could be, in this case scenario, you didn't do anything wrong. It could be that God has another purpose. This guy was righteous and blameless. The exact same things we said about Noah a few weeks ago, we say about Job. God took notice of this guy. We're going to see in a big way God took notice of this guy. And he was so righteous that he was righteous on behalf of his kids. If they had a party, well maybe they messed up. I didn't even hear anything about the party, but maybe they messed up. So I'll do sacrifices for them. And this guy was over the top righteous. But yet we're going to see he goes through incredible struggles. And here's why. There's this really weird a uh, supernatural game of chess goes on behind the scenes that this author gives us the background to. It says in verse 6 that one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came along with them. And let me just say that, Satan doesn't hang out in hell like in a, like a party room waiting for everything to be done. God, he, he's active. You know, he's active in this world. He, he's only one, he can only be one place at one time, but, and he works with demons and all that, but he's active. And here he's presenting himself before the Lord. And the Lord says to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, I came from roaming the earth and going back and forth in it. I think that's his favorite hobby. 8 says that the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright and a man who fears God and shuns evil. So God has taken notice of him. He's very proud of him. He's kind of almost showing him off in a certain way. And I, I would love to live a type of life that God thinks is about me, but not so much that he tells Satan. But, you know what I mean? It's just, okay. So Satan, he's like, okay, well, let's play this. Does Job feel God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hand so that his flocks and hoods are spread throughout the land. You, but if you stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, he'll surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Very well then. Everything he has in your hands, or in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And this is what's going to start our study. This is where we're going to see how the Satan tries to take our joy. How Satan tries to get us to give up. It says, One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at one of the older brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. And the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. So that's pretty bad news right off the bat, right? As he's still speaking, another one comes running up and says, The fire of God. This isn't even like other guys. This is God. I mean, this is supernatural. A fire of God fell from the sky and burned up all the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Okay, still not bad enough. Another servant comes up while he was still speaking and said, These other guys, because I'm not going to pronounce that name, formed three waiting parties and swept down on their camels and carried them off. And they put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. So that guy's lost every single wish he has, and another guy comes running up while they're still speaking. It says, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in 
from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are all dead. And I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. And he fell to the ground in worship. Man. <laughs> that probably would not be my first response. He fell to the ground in worship, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And all this Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. The first thing that tries to steal our joy is things, our stuff, our possessions. We're going to list these up for you. You can write this down because kind of write, write these down, these joy stillers. The first thing is our things. In Job's case scenario, he understood something that you and I forget way too often so that when everything fell apart, he could say, it's in God's hands. And it's this. You and I work so hard for things. You and I work so hard for money, possessions, electricity, uh, you know, utilities, car, vacation, all these things that we work on that we want to own. But if we ever get our focus so off base that we think we actually own those things instead of that God owns them and he gave them to us in trust, then we're already in danger because we don't own them. They own us. You with me on that? Things own us way too much, way too often. The things that we think we need compared to people 100 years ago is insane. You know, like I was reading a story this week and it was talking about a guy who was a rich guy, loved Amish country, moved into Amish country, made this big old mansion, you know, in, in the middle, of, like in the community and he's loading all his stuff in and his Amish neighbor is kind of watching him bring stuff in. He's counting how many chairs he has and how many tables he has. Just kind of like, wow. And so while they're having a conversation later on talking about it, the Amish guy said to him, hey, we welcome you to the neighborhood. If there's anything you ever need, come on over to my house and I'll explain to you how you can get by without it. You know, it, because that's our, our thought process. We, we think we need things because things own us. And so if my job goes away, or if, you know, like some of my funding goes away, or something falls apart, or whatever the case be, I'm stressed out because I don't have my stuff. And what we find in Job is Job says, it's not our stuff, it's God's stuff. And he get, brought me into this world naked, he'll take me out naked, he gave to me, he took it away, that's his decision. Can you imagine having that kind of strength when the enemy's just taking your things? Things that seem to try to take our joy away. Let's keep going in the story and find some others. The chess match continues, chapter 2. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan says, from roaming through the earth, going back and forth in it. And the Lord says, hey, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> Job's like, dude, stop it. There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him with, without any reason. Not a thing has changed between God and Job. Just the stuff. Satan replied, skin for skin. A man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and his bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must Spare his life. Satan goes out in the presence of the Lord and he afflicts Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And then Job takes a piece of broken pottery. If he gets squeamish, this should be the moment. And he scrapes himself with it as he sat in his own ashes. He just takes all of his health away. Let me tell you guys, the second joy still by far is circumstances. The circumstances are coming to our life. We like to pretend like we have it all under control. But realistically, most of the stuff in our life we have no control over. You have no control over that person cutting you off in traffic. You have no control over some other kid taking saying something nasty to your kid and your kid cries. You have no control over most of the things that are going on around us. And there's kind of this facade that somehow we're supposed to be able to figure it all out and keep it all together. Circumstances, most of the time, we don't have, if you have control over it, Great. Do it in the Lord. Identify those things that you have control over and do it in integrity and love and truth and do it well. But the things that you have no control over, stop letting it steal your joy. Some of us, I'm telling you, today are coming into this place with a heavy heart on things that you have no control over. It's the circumstances. He could not change his health in any way, shape, or form any more than you and I can. Yeah, I've been doing that little pinch back thing for the last three days. Sometimes I don't even feel it. Other times it's like... 
You know what I'm saying? I have no control over that. But I have control over my attitude towards it. I have control over how it affects me. So I, he's trying to take and change circumstances to take my joy away. That I'm going to contend here in a little bit that we have options. That we don't let, need to let other people and other things have that much control of our lives. You know how it's control over my life and the things I don't have control over? Him. He has control. Let's continue on. His wife says to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. I love doing the story joke because I'm always tempted to make wife jokes. You notice he took everybody in the family but one person? I'm just saying. She tells him to take and give up and curse God and die. In other words, she says, you know, this stuff doesn't happen unless God's mad at you. Didn't we already talk about that attitude? You might as well curse God and die. You obviously screwed up so much that he just abandoned you. Job's response is, you are talking like a foolish woman. <laughs> Try to get paid with that at home, right? Scott, you know what? No, no, no. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to drag you into this. Mickey, he loves you. Okay. You were talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And in all this, Job did what? Not sin in what he said. Then Job's three friends, Eli, Billy, and Zophie, <laughs> heard about all the troubles that had come upon him. And they set out from their homes and they met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. And they began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Listen, I'm going to contend to you just for a few moments that the third thing that steals our joy is other people. And in this story, we might say, yeah, you know, we need to be more like the friends instead of the wife who is just like, yep, you messed up. Yep, God's mad at you. God's going to beat you up. But I'm going to show you as we go into the next 30 some odd chapters, which we're not going to go through all of them. You can read them at home. So I'm not going to keep you all day. But these guys who came because they loved him, these guys that sacrificed their own life and then say, you know, someone should do something about that. They said, we'll do something about that. We'll go out of our way. We'll sacrifice of our time and we will go and be with him. And when they saw him, they actually partnered with him in their emotions to the point that they told their woes of extreme great, uh, of, uh, grief. They, they took and themselves were sitting there sobbing with this guy. And we're going to find that they actually sat there for seven days crying with him without a single word being spoken. That sounds like a heck of a friend. And these are believing friends. But do you know what they did for 30 some odd chapters? Obviously you made God mad. Obviously you've done something that you should just, I don't know, give up. I, I hate seeing you like this. It might be better off if you're just dead, man. And you know what he kept saying? He goes, no, I've not done anything. I've not done anything against my God. And that takes an extreme focus of integrity to say, I've searched myself. I've looked for any little thing that I could have done that caused this. And you know, I'm okay in front of God. I don't know about you, but I've been at points where it seems like everybody's mad at me, everybody's against me, and the only thing you've got is, you know what, as I really seek this out, I'm, I'm following Him. And sometimes that's got to be enough. If you're seeking it out and you did something wrong, guess what you do? You get it right. But sometimes you just have to say, if none go with me, still I will follow. You remember that hymn? I love that hymn. If no one else goes with me, I will follow. And that's what Job was doing here, why his friends, in loving ways and in hateful ways, were just berating him over and over again. Obviously you messed up, give up, curse God, die. Obviously you messed up, curse God, die. And with the most flowery speech. And I'm going to tell you this, sometimes your own Christian brothers and sisters, with all the well-meaning that they have, can be your worst enemies when it comes to joy. If they're focused on the worldly ways of thinking about things instead of God. You see what I mean? These are huge joy Stillers that we're talking about. Let's go to this next one. Still in chapter 2, verse 13. Okay, so we see that they sit on the ground. Within seven days, they don't say a word. And it says that no one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. If I have huge problems and I sit for seven days under a tree thinking about them, I'm probably stressing out. Okay? I'm probably stressing out. And that's the fourth one I'm going to say. It comes to your stress, <laughs> worry, taking and basically, I, I'm trying to remember the exact phrase I heard this. And maybe I saw on Facebook, might have been in one of my books, but it said, the worry is basically imagining a future without God. Stop and think about that for a second. 
I was to think about how much time you stress out, how much time you worry, how, many, how much time you're like, I just don't know how this is going to work out. It's basically imagine a future of what happens if God does not come through on your behalf. If you have accepted Jesus as leader and forgiver in your life, if you've acknowledged with your mouth that He's the Son of God, died and rose again, you take and believe that He has that victory over death and sin for you, and you acknowledge that and you, you bring Him into your life and you change your life to follow Him, then He is now your daddy. Okay? And your daddy cares about you. And if you are in worry and you are in stress, then you're saying, Daddy, you're not going to be able to come through on this one. Is basically what we're saying. You still with me? And that just sucks the life right out of you. I mean, you, you, you've had to been there at least once before, right? Because I'm there way too often of just kind of letting Satan get in there and attack us through our stuff and worried about our stuff and our money, our circumstances, our people. And it, he said, he's just saying, just be faithful to me and I'll be faithful to you. The door's wide open. It's just right there. Let's look at how his life takes and plays out. This is the effect, chapter 3. After he sat there for seven days, Job opened his mouth and he cursed the day he was born. He said, May the day of my birth perish, and the night it was said a boy is born. That day may turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine upon it. May darkness and deep shadow claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May dark, the blackness overwhelm its light. That night may thick darkness seize it. May it not be included among the days of the years, nor may it be entered into any of the months. May that night be barren, may no shout of joy be heard in it. May those who curse days curse that day. Those who are ready to rouse labyrinth, may its morning stars become dark, may it wait for daylight in vain, and not see the first rays of dawn, for it did not shut the doors of the room on me to hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the room? I'm thinking, man, can you come up with any more ways of saying you just wish you were dead? You know what I mean? Like, I, I really do believe true poetry comes out of true hurt, true emotion. And this guy is to the point that it, it's almost kind of hopelessness. It's just, I kind of, I wish I'd never came to be. And, and all, all these different, just negative emotions, but yet he didn't do one thing. Did you catch it? He never cursed God. He never said that God did it. He never said God's being unfair. He's just saying, you know what, this is what God had for me. I just kind of wish I could have skipped the whole thing altogether. Right? Just kind of completely be gone from it all. So these guys talk to him as we talked about, and they keep going back and forth, and all these different things happen, but it takes us up to chapter 38. As we've heard Job speak, and we heard where Job is at, and we know that his, his friends are just kind of taking things down and kind of just putting more and more weight on his shoulders. And it gets to this point where God decides he's going to speak <laughs> as well. And uh, that's always an interesting time. And I'm telling you, this is probably some of my favorite scripture when it comes to God. And for those who are here Wednesday night, uh, we talk about fearing God. And then through the fear of God, being able to be released into the joy of God. Uh, this is an incredible example uh, within that and some of the things that we see about the Lord. But in chapter 38, it says, The Lord answers Job out of a stone. He says, basically, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, because I'm going to ask you, and you're going to answer me. Because I want to know if you were the one that took and set up the earth. I want to know if you set up its foundations. I want to know if you're the one that calls out each star by name each night. I want to know if you were the one that put the oceans in place and said, this far your mighty waves can come, but here's where your proud waves are going to halt. So that every time I'm on the ocean, look at this ocean that can easily overwhelm me. I know it's God who says, nope, that wave stops there. I want to know whether or not you're the one that has all things in your hands, all knowledge, all place, all power. I want to know, are you the one? Can you even tell me what's going on tomorrow? Can you do that? No. I'm God. You're not. And you might not understand what I'm doing, but I'll tell you what, I'm the one that's doing it, and I understand it, and you need to have enough faith in me to follow that path. Because I've got you. I'm your daddy. And if I'm taking you through this, there's a reason for it. I tell you what, from a human standpoint, I look at the story and I think it's so unbelievably unfair to Job that he had to lose everything the way that he did. But you know what? I would go through something like this if 6,000 years later people were still talking about it and it was bringing glory to the name of the Lord. Amen. If you look at the scholars talking about what's the oldest book of the Bible, there's a little bit of dispute. It's either going to be Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, the five books that Moses wrote, or some believe it's Job. They're not necessarily just slapped in there in order. 
And I don't know who wins and who doesn't, but they're all both old. And they bring some sort of comfort to me that one of the oldest stories that God wrote that said, I want this down, I want people to know this, is about going through struggle and how God still has us and how He still loves us and how He's got us in His hands. That brings comfort to me. It brings comfort to me that my daddy says, come on now, this is who I am, and I've got you. I've got you. As we continue the story, as they're going back and forth, it's an incredible conversation. God basically makes a couple declarations. He says, Job, you did good, boy. You didn't curse me. You didn't give up. Your friends need forgiveness. And I will forgive the three of you when Job makes a sacrifice on your behalf and when Job prays for you, which thankfully he did. If you're thinking love on somebody and you give them advice, make sure it's godly. Make sure it's godly and not worldly advice. We find in chapter 42, if you'll turn a few more pages, the end of our story. It says in verse 7, that after the Lord had said these things to Job, okay, again, he talks about his two friends. But in chapter, verse 10, it says, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him be, uh, before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought upon him, and each one of them gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. They weren't holding on to their stuff either. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, basically everything just doubled like mad, including daughters and family. Verse 16 says, After this, Job lived 140 years, and he saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so he died old and full of years. In other words, God restored him. But I'll tell you one thing I know about Job, is that if God didn't bring back the double of everything, he still would have walked with the Lord. I have no control. I, I am not in my relationship with the Lord to have stuff. I don't want that. I want him to have me. I don't want to have stuff. Right? I, I want him in my life because he holds all the circumstances in his life, in my life, in his hands. I want that. You still with me? I want people in my life that encourage me so that I can be built up so I can go out and encourage others and lead others to the Lord. All of these things need to be turned back around into the joy, which again is a conscious choice decision. If you're sitting here today and you're like, this life blows, everything's falling apart, I just have no joy, I don't see any light, nothing else is going on, have you stopped and thought, is this my fault? Because if it is, you can stop that. You have some control. Is it somebody else's fault? What did we say at the beginning? Bring some forgiveness and some boundaries and step back up again. You have some choices there. If it's God, then you have your choice is to say, you know what, I'm holding on. What are you going to do? Because I'll go anywhere you want me to go because being without you is just unthinkable. Right. Here's the thing Job's had, and these, we'll put these up for you too. These are the things we're going to be studying into through Philippians. First off, he had a single mind. He was single-minded. And when you're single-minded on God, that will bring you joy in spite of any circumstance that you're going through. Think that through for a second. When you are single-minded on God, it will take you through any circumstance because the world has nothing in comparison that can take you out. The next one we're going to be talking about is if you have a submissive mind. If you have a submissive mind to you, God, it will give you joy in spite of the people that are around you. No one look around. Okay? No, no pointing fingers. No nagging wives. No pain in the butt husbands who aren't filling their job at the home by being spiritual leaders. No comment there. Right? But if you are in submission to God, no one, what does anybody have on him? Nothing. Nothing. A spiritual mind is the third thing that he had. If you have a spiritual mind and you look at things from God's viewpoint and his character and his word, then there is nothing, nothing that can take away your joy. There is no problem with things anymore. In spite of things. If you have a life, you have nothing. If you have a spiritual mind, you see things through God's standpoint. And the third thing, or the fourth thing, is a secure mind. If you have a secure mind in the Lord, you have a joy that defeats worry because nothing's going to mess up your daddy having you. Nothing. And if you look at all four of those, there's one common denominator, isn't there? It's your choice. <coughs> it's your choice. So as we continue into this study, as we continue into this series, I'm going to again take and completely mind you over and over again, you have choices to make 
in this. Life is not so bad that you are done. We have choices to make. We have things we can hold on to. And when we get into the story of Philippians, I want you to remember one thing as we go through the entire thing. Every single word, every morsel that comes out of it. Paul, when he wrote it, was in prison waiting for his death. <laughs> so if you're coming in here and saying, you know, life's just too hard. And I've, you know, I saw this thing about joy and I need joy and I just want some happiness. I'm not talking happiness. I'm talking joy. And no matter what you're going through, the author who's about to take us through this journey knows what you're talking about. The guy we just read about knows what you're talking about. And if we're really honest, they probably know it a lot better than us. And we need to stop whining and make some new choices. We need to stop keeping the same cycles and go to some new places. So that's kind of the introduction part of this. And again, I know introductions, whenever we're getting into new study series, there's not a lot of emotional charge. And everybody's like, oh. And maybe you'll come here today and say, man, I just need something because I just feel like I'm about to give up. And all that stuff's logical and that's all great. I just want to share with you one thing that encouraged me this week. And maybe somebody needs to hear it because it felt like there's something with the spirit on it. When I was working on this sermon, sometimes I'm back here in my office, sometimes I'm at home, sometimes I'm on the front porch, and sometimes I'm having lunch. My favorite place to do studies, right? And I was over at Stumpo's, if you guys have ever been to Stumpo's, right? Little mom and pop place, just a couple of miles away. Okay, you guys seem excited, a little bit too excited, that's great. Um, they're open on Sundays maybe, uh, so go on over. But the owner, if you guys have ever been around, again, it's very mom and pop, very family oriented. There's usually a couple of kids running around and they're like, freaking out and stuff. And so it's a little, little crazy. But the owner had his two kids there, and I think the daughter's probably somewhere around five, and the son's probably somewhere around seven. He must have been out of school, and he was kind of watching them while working. And, and I, I heard him say, they were kind of around the corner, so I couldn't really see him. Um, but I heard him say, hey, Dad's got to go to the store. I'll be back in a few minutes. You know, everybody else is here. You're fine, whatnot. And so he leaves, and we're just kind of going on. And all of a sudden, I hear the little girl just start crying. I mean, just like something happened. She's, she's crying quite a bit. And these two other ladies uh, were sitting where they could see, and like one goes running over, like, oh, sweetie, are you okay? And they're like trying to, to help her and kind of get her mind off of her. But basically, what happened is that the, the stool somehow went down on her foot and got her really upset, upset, and so she's crying, and her brother's probably giggling because he didn't seem like he killed at all. But, <laughs> but she was really upset. I mean, her whole world had stopped. And they were like saying, well, you know, if you rub it, that, that would take it away, which we know is really kind of not true, but that's what stuff we say to kids, just kind of get their minds off things. And, you know, that kind of stuff, and they're trying to comfort her. And she said in the midst of all the tears, and this is the thing that stood out to me, she goes, I'll be okay when Daddy gets back and I can tell him about it. And as a father, you're just like, oh. As you see that with your kids, you know, you remember that as a kid yourself, but just how important our children look at us in those moments to make it all okay again. I mean, I, I could do the same foot rubbing thing that the ladies are talking about, but to Emily it makes all the difference just that daddy knows, daddy's there, and he's got me in his arms, right? He is your daddy. He's your daddy. And I can get up here and tell you all kinds of stuff. And I can take and do whatever efforts we can do. But there's nothing like just being able to tell your daddy. There's nothing like just him grabbing hold of you. And I thought that moment, like, man, there's just times I need him. And then he reminded me, he's like, son, if you don't have me, you're just completely gone. If you're struggling today, let him hold you and remind you. Once again, he's got this. And I know I say it all the time, and I almost bet that some people, every time we say it, we're just like, yeah, I just need that reminder. Maybe you need it for the thousandth time today. He's got this. You can hold on to him. You can cry in his arms. He loves you.